It's good for you to know historicity. You know there's a difference between facts and the recording of facts. And there's a difference between facts and what purports to record facts. In the internet era, that should be plain to everyone. When scholars talk about historicity, what they mean is, looking at an ancient account, how sure can we be that it happened? Okay, so if you had the videotape, right, would it match up to the account that we have? That's the question of historicity. And it's an important question. For one thing, even if none of us had any you know, faith stake in the question, if none of us were uh, interested in the religion, religions that are associated with King David, then we would simply say, well, I just want to know, did it happen? I'm kind of curious about that. And so you have archaeologists, for example, digging around in Iron Age level excavations in Jerusalem, looking for this. Okay, that looks like somebody did something then, a long time ago. How long ago? Where? Did it happen in a way that matches with some written text or some oral account based on that written text? These are questions of historicity. Okay, now it's an important question though for those of us with a faith perspective. The reason for that is because we have a historically grounded faith. And when I say we, uh, I mean actually all three of the monotheisms are this way. Islam, Judaism, Christianity all claim to have some encounter with the transcendent in time, in history. God did something here. And everything flows from that. All three of them agree about that. Now, of course, the details are quite different, but. But what Judaism and Christianity especially share is this concept of history as a manifestation of God's will, ongoing. King David is a part of that, a big part of that, actually. What we'll talk about this afternoon is his role as a transitional figure to a new kind of society. And that role says a lot to us about how God operates in our lives. But back to the question of historicity for just a second. You know, I mean, you might ask the question, well, I believe in Jesus, and I know Jesus was a historical individual. What about King David? Does it matter? Does the historicity of the David accounts matter? That's a good question. That's actually, you know, partly a theological question. In fact, mostly a theological question, right? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, etc. Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and was buried, rose again on the third day. Those are historical statements. That stuff either happened or it didn't. And if it didn't happen, your faith is in vain, right? As St. Paul tells us. King David is not in the creed. So does it matter? Okay, if you don't believe in Samson, can you be saved? Well, yeah, it's a theological question though, right? Because actually what we're talking about then too is the relationship between the record of faith, the Bible, and the living tradition. What's passed on by the teaching of the church as necessary and the interaction between those two. Now that's a huge question, actually gigantic question. And you probably know that that question is one of the main sticking points between the various kinds of Protestant denominations and the Catholic Church. That is to say, the authority of the Bible. But what all Protestants and Catholics also have in common is again, this element of historicity has to be there in some sense. So it is still a live question for Catholics about King David and the historicity of it, the reliability of those accounts. There's something there that we should explore. There are extreme camps. One camp would call themselves biblical minimalists. Okay, and this is associated especially with an archeological movement 
which then informs, uh, I should say, a school of thinking that's informed by archaeology that then informs a kind of history of ancient Israel, which basically says it's fabricated. You know, there's scholars that, that come to those conclusions, and they say, all these stories about David are just that, stories. There's no King David. This is a kind of legend that tells us about later concepts of nation. Right? It tells us about who they wanted to be. It's a, it's a legendary figure, that's all. You know, um, we have that in, in various cultures, you know, where we're talking about you know, Hiawatha or something. You know, was there a historical Hiawatha? Probably not. It doesn't really matter. It's a hero, and it tells us about their values. That's the biblical minimalist point of view. On the other hand, we might call it fundamentalist. A reading of the Bible which is completely devoted to literal truth in every way, shape, and form. So like those examples I showed you in the morning about, you know, it seems like there's two guys named Goliath killed by two different people. Well, yes, there was. There had to have been because the Bible makes no mistakes in any way. Okay, so that kind of perspective that won't admit to any slippage between fact and record, we could call that fundamentalism. Now, that's a bit of a name calling. You know, the biblical minimalists don't mind being called that name. They'll embrace that, you know, but nobody wants to say, yeah, I'm a fundamentalist and proud of it. You know, maybe they got a, a hat that says, you know, number one fundamentalist dad. You know, they're, they're not going to call themselves that. But, uh, but basically, I think I've characterized, you know, those are the extremes. Everything happened or it's all a story. I think a better question for us to handle, as opposed to, you know, well, what actually happened, because it's kind of hard to get to, which I'll tell you about in a second. A good question for us to handle, though, is why? Why did they record it? Why tell the history at all? What does it mean? I mean, why bother telling us about King David? And as I said before, it wasn't us that they were telling. Why did the biblical authors write what they wrote? What were their motivations? We can talk about that head on. For example, we can say the biblical authors are concerned to show that Saul was a real historical king, but it didn't work out. But David stuck in his place, and that did work out. They're concerned with explaining that to people, right? And they do that in an interpretive way. So here is Samuel saying to Saul, the Lord would have established your kingdom, but now your kingdom will not continue because you did X, Y, Z, and you didn't do A, B, C. So it's a kind of a rationale. Again, in 1 Chronicles, this is just a summary judgment. It's the narrator telling us Saul died for his unfaithfulness. He was unfaithful to the Lord, and therefore the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. So this is an interpretation. Not only do we talk about history as a recording of facts, we also talk about history as an interpretation of those facts. That's also what history is. The Samuel authors are better at that than the chronicler is. That's why his books are more popular, I would say. They're more widely read. The chronicler, well, he chronicles. He tells you X begot Y, Y begot Z, Z begot A. There's a lot of names, not a lot of interpretation. Everybody with me so far? Good, so let's go back to talk a little bit about historicity. The biblical minimalists uh, do have some problems, all right? So um, this was an item found, uh, I guess it was the early 90s. This was uh, an inscription found, it was probably like a monument erected by uh, a king over Damascus, telling about all his exploits. 
I killed these people, I beat these people up. This is what ancient kings used to do, right? Um, sort of advertising themselves. And way at the bottom, oh, by the way, uh, I killed this guy of the house of David, and blah, 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 blah. It's kind of fun when those things pop up in the, in the archaeological record. You know, I mean, when he was writing this, he wouldn't have known about this group meeting today to find something interesting. You know, House of David sounds like just another. This is a, a typical Semitic way of talking, right? Various Semitic languages would use this expression, house of such and such. It simply means like the group associated with or more narrowly, the family associated with. So House of David means, in this context, the line of, of David, the family of David, the Davidic dynasty. As you can see uh, by the slide, the inscription is dated to about 870 BC. So does this prove about a historical individual named King David? Not really. It's talking about a group descended from a person named David, but that person would have only lived about 100 years before this was written. So it's quite plausible that there was a historical memory that's remembered in this piece. The thing about archaeology, which we might call external evidence, is it can't really prove the existence of a particular person that easily. Imagine yourself. 3,000 years from now, how much evidence will there be of you? <laughs> well, you still existed, right? We can say some things generally about the time frame that we're talking about, which is when. Okay, so I said uh, King David estimated, this is a good round number to keep in mind, about 1000 BC. So we're talking about the 10th century BC, so into the 900s BC. That's the traditional dating. It's very hard to say with any certainty, is that exactly accurate? Or is it 100 years later? Very hard to say that. Nobody, I'll go out on a limb and say nobody can prove that with the data that we have right now. Getting into like the 9th century BC, the 8th century BC, we start to see monumental structures. Like that thing that was on the first slide, the stepped stone structure, probably from around the 9th century BC. So we're talking about 800s. So is that like King David? Hard to say. You gotta keep in mind, King David is the first king of a united monarchy to do anything. So it's unlikely that he's gonna be popping up towers and fortresses right and left, it'll take a little while for that culture, that material culture, to start establishing itself. So again, it's proof neither for nor against in that regard. What we can say, though, is that the entire time frame that we're talking about during King David, King Solomon, and then maybe another 100 or 150 years after that, that time frame of having kingdoms emerge in what is now the Holy Land, Israel, that fits well with what we know of geopolitical history at that time. Because the major empires in Egypt and in Mesopotamia were weak during that time. So it would have been possible for a smaller kingdom to establish itself. When I say the major powers, Egypt and Mesopotamia, you know, we're, we're talking about huge world civilizations with an enormous amount of learning in terms of architecture and art, literacy, mathematics, engineering, and military might. You're not gonna find stuff like this in ancient Israel archeology. span They just were too dorky to do it. They just couldn't do it. <laughs> Right, so, I mean, this mask of Sargon of Akkad, this is like what? This is like 2000 BC or something like that? I'm, of course, guessing, but I, I think it's around this, you know, and Tutankhamen, right? This is like 1500 BC, something like this, right? So this is, we're talking about 500 or 1000 years before the period that we're discussing with King David, with that stepped stone structure, you know, with those clumsy bricks there. 
you know, the Hebrews, the Israelites, were not a handy people. <laughs> they were good writers and good thinkers and good prayers, right? But we're not going to find the material remains from that culture that we find in these other cultures. But again, just to say that it does kind of fit the general time frame, right? That you would have a united monarchy stretching throughout modern day Israel, a little bit up into Syria and out into Jordan during this time when these two kingdoms, these two empires, I should say, were at a low ebb. That does make sense. Taking a look at the topography, that's always important. Obviously not a detailed map, but you can tell enough from it. The area that we're mostly concerned about, and here you can also consult your, um, your handout map if you have that with you. We're mostly concerned with the historical David with this area of what came to be called the Kingdom of Judah. Laser pointer is not working, pardon me. But it's basically, you see where that larger body of water is, not, not the ocean, but <laughs> the, the Dead Sea, right? So you can see the Jordan Valley kind of in the middle of the picture there. And then uh, if you just kind of go to the north of the Dead Sea and then to the left. So that's the Judean hill country. That's the, the center of David's polity, David's political rule. You can see in the topography map, you know, that's kind of uh, a beige color. Well, that means there's not a whole lot of rainfall there. There's a lot of hills. It's sloping country, good grazing country, good for perennials like vines and olives and things like that. But you can't raise a whole lot of food there. If you look at some of the, the greener areas there along the coastline and then up in the north, you can see where there was more money to be made, more green, as it were. The northern tribes of Israel, you can see several of them in the second slide there, were better off agriculturally and therefore financially. Also, the coastal plain, also somewhat of a favorable location. So David and his uh, entourage, which then, of course, consolidates a rule in the central city of Jerusalem, they're somewhat of, an, of a disadvantaged location. So something of an underdog, even nationally, geographically speaking. Here's the overdogs. We do have a lot of evidence, inscriptions, bas reliefs you can see from Egyptian sources there, pottery, all kinds of stuff from these guys. Anyone know who these are? These are the Philistines. These are the Philistines. Okay, so this is, this is sort of a turning point in the early history of the Israelites. You can read about the Philistines emerging, yes, in the book of 1 Samuel, but a little bit even in the book of Judges, which precedes that. The Philistines were a coastal people. You can see they've got kind of a worship thing going on in the, the top right relief there. And they're related to Greek-speaking peoples, seagoing peoples living in the Aegean and on the west coast of Asia Minor. And it was a materially more, I would say, cosmopolitan and advanced culture than their neighbors, the Israelites. How do we know that? A number of reasons. Uh, pottery. Okay, so they're just better at it. They make nicer, more interesting, more finished ware. You can see that in the bottom left, Philistine style jugs. And we see that same kind of style, again, internationally. So these people had like trading connections. Israelites didn't do that. They weren't interested in going out on boats and things. You know, they're kind of homebodies. The Philistines are also recorded as having a lot of superior weaponry, chariots. The chariot was like the uh, Abrams tank, right? You know, of the old school. What's so cool about it? Well, for one thing, it's fast, right? It's on wheels, drawn by horses. Horses are not just, you know, my little pony. And those are war weapons. 
right? What you do is you'd knock your opponent down and then the, the hooves would trample the guy, right? So that's, that's how that worked. And where do these things work well? They work well on flat terrain, right? So the Philistines had this very strong power base along the coast. So I said that David and his bunch had somewhat of a disadvantage up in the hills. Well, maybe not. Actually, can't use chariots too well up there. So there, there was somewhat of a detente between these two groups. But one thing that was turning the tide, really, though, was the Philistine mastery of iron. I referred already to the Iron Age. OK, so that's an archaeological term. It's a scientific term. We're just going to kind of round off the edges here and talk about Bronze Age versus Iron Age. And you see that transition happening in the scriptural texts. You can even see it in the inscription. Do you see how the Philistines? Look, they're all shaved. They're all clean shaven. Got to have good, sharp iron implements to do that. Let's take a look at the text here. So this is 1 Samuel 13. And this is under Saul. This is during the wars against the Philistines with Saul. There was no smith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, the Hebrews must not make swords or spears for themselves. So all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen their plowshares. Oh, what, what an embarrassment. Right? They have, to, they have to go rent laptops, right? They can't even, you know. And then it says here, uh, the charge was two-thirds of a shekel. And there's a Hebrew word for that that denomination, two-thirds of the shekel, uh, for the plowshares. And this is kind of an interesting piece here. Okay, so we've talked about external evidence, right? Archaeology and reliefs, art, stuff like that. We could call that external historical evidence. Okay, so that's stuff outside of the Bible, talking about stuff in the Bible. I mean, not directly, right? I killed so-and-so of the house of David. He's not interested in the Bible, right? But he's just mentioning that. That's external evidence. This is internal evidence, what we're looking at right here. So this is data from the Bible that's of, histor of historical value. I mean, think about this. Why would somebody write this? They're recording the prices of how much it costs to sharpen plowshares and mags. You know, that's not really an ideological thing. That's a historical memory that has survived in this text. They thought it would be of interest to the reader, relatable to the reader. Everyone see that? It's local information. It's local history. And that's actually kind of an interesting point here, too, because as it turns out, the shekel as a unit of money was discontinued after the Babylonian exile. The word continued. In fact, that's the, the money in Israel today, is shekels. But it was no longer in use. You had Babylonian euros or something, you know. <laughs> But this word pim, two-thirds of a shekel, archaic word, only here in the Bible. It's the only use of it. Somebody wrote this thinking that the readers would know what that word meant. But nobody knew what that meant after 586 BC and the exile. So that's internal evidence. That's kind of interesting. Okay, That tells you a little bit, good guess, about when this was written. Who cares? It does tell you that it wasn't all made up. This is not a fairy tale, right? It's got some roots in a real memory. And we can date where that memory began. On the right, another interesting piece of internal evidence. Here's King David. Uh, so this is uh, an internal monologue that the um, narrator is giving for us. You know, so King Saul is pursuing King David. He's jealous of him. A lot more on that to come. But David is trying to run away and save his life. And what does he do? Something very unexpected. He goes and he joins the Philistines. He goes and joins the Nazis, right? This is crazy, right? He goes and joins the enemy. He says, there's nothing better for me than to go and escape to the land of the Philistines. Now, why would you make that up? You know, that is embarrassing. Historians of scripture, biblical scholars, call this the criterion of embarrassment. Okay, this means like it's very unlikely that a writer trying to push an agenda 
in this case, you know, King David is so great, it's very unlikely he would make up that information. He knew about it, and he had to explain it. This is his way of explaining it. But as a piece of fiction, it's a really dumb idea to make this up about your hero. Everyone see that? Yeah, I think so. Notice uh, the little editorial comment that the narrator makes on the right. Uh, so King David is, he's not king yet. David is given Ziklag, the city of Ziklag, as his kind of like home base in the Philistine territory. And then it says, therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Again, a little note, not for you, but for whoever's reading this. When is to this day? Not sure. But that's the kind of stuff that we look at when we try to do dating internally, try to figure out when was this written and for whom was it written. Interesting stuff. What does it all mean? Okay, so I said history is about not just recording facts, but about interpreting those facts. We can introduce another, uh, another word here at this point. It's called historiography. Historiography, literally the writing of history. You might say, well, isn't that the same thing as history? When we study historiography, we're studying how the history was written. What were the choices that were being made? What was told? What was not told? What did they decide to say in order to put a certain image out there, a certain idea out there? History is a kind of drama that way. You know, a good history, I probably have all read a, a work of history that we really liked reading. You know, why did we like it? Because it had all the facts there? You can get that on, you know, Siri can get that for you. You know, here's what I found on the web, right? That's not what a historian does. A historian interprets and tells a story, a personal story. Here's what the Civil War meant. Not just a list of battles. Here are some of the themes that we find in the historiography. For one thing, we're making the transition from the book of Judges and the period of the Judges to the books of Kings and the period of the Kings. Okay, so that's, those are literally, of course, you know, the English titles of those books, also translations of the Hebrew titles. But the idea of a judge and a king is important to unpack a little bit. When Israel was settled in its land after the Exodus, right, and the storyline of the people in the land begins, who were the leaders? They're just kind of random people that pop up. Judges, they're called. We shouldn't think too much in terms of, you know, like the legal judge. You know, like they're sitting and pronouncing judgment. They're more like, you know, hardcore heroes that are out there swinging things around and killing Philistines. And, you know, when it says that Shamgar judged Israel or Samson judged Israel, it meant that this was the hero for that time. This, he was the superhero for that era. And they really make him out to be like that sometimes. Samson is described as a judge, right? What does he do? He's got like super strength, right? It's all in his, in his hair, you know? I mean, it's, it's almost legendary, right? Deborah, a female judge, right? So she pronounces oracles of the Lord and decides who's going to go into battle and when. You know, this is extraordinary stuff, you know? I mean, these are maybe historical memories. It doesn't really matter. The point here is that these are individuals. It's not an institution. They come and they go. After Deborah, who's next? We don't know. It's not a system at all, right? There's invaders coming from California to steal our water, right? Who will deliver us? Some, one of you will stand up and the spirit of the Lord will rush upon him or her and you know, drive them back to California. But 
Can that keep happening over and over again? It could, but it's very unpredictable. It's very unpredictable. For one thing, it's very local, right? These judges are just in one place or another place, right? They live only in Salem or in Portland or, you know, so it's always unpredictable where this is going to happen. And it's also not organized at all, right? This is not predictable. There's no system of governance that can come from this. This is just deliverance at the moment by whoever is available. It's also a very, like, honor-based and kinship-based way of life. These are big men and one woman who has, you know, they have the respect of people, and therefore people follow them. But what happens when there's a small person who has a real claim to justice? How does that person get justice? There's no system for that. Okay, so what we're talking about is a kind of uh, disaggregated, a kind of voluntaristic, unorganized, sometimes nepotistic, quote unquote, system, the period of the judges. We have a turning point in the first book of Samuel. The last judge is Samuel. And this is how Samuel operates, right? The Philistines come and they turn to Samuel and they say, Thank, help us, Samuel. And he calls on the Lord and fire comes down from heaven and then the Israelites go and, you know, it's this, it's this miraculous one-time thing, like the way it keeps happening. What's going to happen when Samuel's gone? When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges. But that's not how it works. Right? You don't, you don't elect somebody judge. It's only the Spirit of God right, that makes somebody able to deliver. And it's not going to happen. right? His sons did not follow in his ways. So the elders of Israel said, appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. We want a regular system. Right? We want to know who's in charge and who's next. Right? And what do we do when we have a problem? Rather than just wait around until miraculously something happens. This is a very important moment in the history of the nation. We'll come back to this when we talk about the idea of Messiah. Because there's something else very important in this. I, I think you can see it right at the bottom of there. The thing displeased Samuel. And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me from being king over them. Now, that's a very extraordinary statement, actually, for the Old Testament, which in many ways reveres kings right, and the kingship. We'll come back to that when we talk about the institution of the Messiah. But what we're doing here is we're transitioning from the judge system to now a national polity, a political system. Somebody's in charge. It doesn't go smoothly because who is in charge? Human. Which human? Saul. King Saul. Doesn't go that well. It's a very rocky transition. It's interesting to look at the anointing scenes between King Saul and King David, right? Both of them are anointed, as I said, you know, chosen by God to do this. And they're both anointed by the same guy, by Samuel. Look at the scene on the left, 1 Samuel 10. This is the anointing of Saul. We're not going to look in detail because it's long. Okay, so Samuel anoints him, and then he said, the Lord has anointed you. You will depart from me today, and you're going to meet two guys, and then you go from there, and you're going to come to the Oak of Tabor, and then they're going to give you two loaves of bread, and then you go here, and then the Spirit of the Lord will possess you, and then do whatever you want. But then after that, go down to Gilgal, and then I'll come to you, and I'll offer sacrifices, wait for me seven days, and then I'll show you what to do. Yeah, okay. Um, 
let me write all that down, right? I got to post it here somewhere. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's almost a comedy, right? It's almost funny, but uh, why? Well, Samuel has the authority. He's the man. He's the kingmaker. Fire from heaven, right? So this is the word of the God. This is the word of God through the last judge and a prophet. So what's Saul supposed to do? Aye, aye, I'll, I'll try. It doesn't work very well. Contrast with David. The Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Okay, very clear. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. The spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Then Samuel left. That's it. Samuel doesn't show up again. Actually, he shows up once more, but he and David have nothing to say to each other. He doesn't give him this elaborate set of instructions. He's not in charge. David's in charge. Different rules. Different time in history. What did Saul do wrong exactly? Uh, We have to talk about Saul because we're talking about David. I mean, the authors do that for us, you know. I mean, the books of Samuel are about Saul and David. Why didn't it work out with Saul? He disobeyed. What were the commands? What specifically did he do wrong? We'll get there in a second. So one of them is hidden in this text on the left. It says, seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. Saul had a battle going on. He was a general in that battle. He waited the seven days. He was going to wait for, Saul, for Samuel to come and offer sacrifice. Samuel was late. He offers a sacrifice. Then he shows up and says, what did you do? You were late. I waited. I mean, it's okay. You didn't do exactly what you were told. Susan mentioned the other one. Samuel says, the Lord has anointed you king, and the Lord has a group of people who he wants you to do something about. They are called Amalekites. We'll come back to them. This is a bad guy. They are the enemies of the Lord. I want you to go and exterminate them, completely destroy them. And Saul does sort of like an 85% job. And, you know, he's sort of greedy, a little bit lazy. And then when Samuel confronts him about it, he sort of, you know, carps a bit and says, well, I did most of it. You know, don't get on my case. I'm doing okay. So Samuel says, you're done. We're moving on. Different king now. Okay, so it's very hands-on here. Right? So Samuel is still in charge. That's the point I'm trying to make here. When it comes to King David, we have a whole different set of circumstances, as I said, and we have a whole different concept of the people. Saul was a little bit diffident. He didn't really want to take too much charge of folks. He was worried about how people might think about him. King David, on the other hand, has a very, I would say, uh, fulsome leadership. Okay, so here is the kind of thing we would call now a nation. Check out this paragraph from 2 Samuel 8. So this is sort of at the height of his power, right, before everything kind of starts crumbling. This random Gentile king, King Toy of Hamath, sent his son to greet him and congratulate him. Okay, so we have some diplomacy going on here. And David dedicated silver and gold from all the nations that he subdued. So we have some tribute system going on here, some internationalism going on here. Look in verse 15. 15. So David reigned over all Israel and administered justice and equity to all his people. Okay, so there's a system now of justice. It's different from might makes right. And then look at the officials, beginning of bureaucracy. It can be a good thing. Now you know who is over the army, who is the recorder, who are the priests, who is the secretary. Things are more organized now. And by the way, if you have now organization and a secretary and a recorder, it means you can have 
this. That's where this is coming from, historically. All right, so remember all those accounts of, okay, Saul did this wrong, and that's why he's not king, but King David did this right, and that's, that's probably where we got it. Maybe from his own court, or just a little bit later. And something to point out here that is actually kind of, again, a little bit embarrassing. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelicites. So who are they? What is that? Usually when you hear ites in the Bible, eyes tend to glaze over, you know, as electrolytes, you know, whatever. You know. <laughs> but it, it sometimes it's worth looking into these things. These guys are not Israelites. These are foreign mercenaries. They're Philistines. They're a subgroup of Philistines. That's interesting. So David is using foreign mercenaries in his army. Okay, so that's a pretty different thing than the judges. This is a new world, right? This is a world where we'll use what we can get if it serves the right ends. It's a political world. Oh, and by the way, David's sons were priests. What? <laughs> the system was not quite what it ended up being at this point. What the king says goes. He can make them priests if he wants. What accounts for David's success? You know, we're talking in a historical vein now, right? Um, there's a spiritual answer to that. You know, someone pointed out David is a man after God's own heart. In fact, it even said that in the text we just looked at. But historically, why was he successful? You can see some of it here. Professionalism, a kind of confidence, the willingness to engage in politics, and a sense of also ethics. This is interesting. This is a speech from 1 Samuel 25. This is a speech given by David's second wife, Abigail. Abigail was described as being beautiful, but also very clever. And this is a brilliant political speech that she gives. She gives it because her husband, Nabal, the fool, who I mentioned in the first talk, refused to honor David, refused to give him any food, and David was about to go out and, you know, make him pay. Violence. Abigail intercepts him. She brings all kinds of goodies, and then she delivers this brilliant speech. What does she say? The Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from taking vengeance with your own hand. Past tense, hasn't happened yet. She is putting an idea in his mind. Maybe you should restrain. What else does she say? Please forgive the trespass of your servant. Okay, very courtly speech, humble. She says, the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. So she knows where the future is going. Right? And she puts that idea in King David's mind. You don't need to prove anything here. She says, When the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, in other words, be patient, be cool, then she says, Then my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause. Why bother taking revenge for this person? You know you're going to be in charge. You're on the ascendancy. It's better for you to play it cool in this scenario. That's very smart. This is a political speech. And then she adds, also covering her own political ends, she says, and when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. She means me. Okay, so make sure I have a role to play here too. This is politics, right? She's advising him to be a king and not a chieftain, not a bandit, to be above that, right? So she sees in a very wise way what the future really holds for him and how he can play into that. We should talk a little bit uh, with remaining time about what this means for us. Why are we talking about this?
How does God act exactly? You know, it, at certain times in our life, we might wish to hear directly from God, you know, audibly, or with some kind of special effects, fire from heaven. But what we're seeing in these stories, the transition from the judges to the kings, God is not absent, but he's working in history in an invisible way. How does he work? Let's take a look at this passage. This is the passage, right? The confrontation of David after his sin with Bathsheba. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to David. The prophet confronts him. He says, you have struck down this man with the sword and have taken his wife. Therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house. I will take your wives and give them to your neighbor. You did it secretly, but I will do it before all Israel. Actions have consequences. And our conscience moves us towards the right or the wrong. What we do in our dealings in history, in our local politics, and I'm not talking about voting now, I mean the institutions that we're part of, our church, our family, our town, right? This has something to do with God's action in history. Following what we know is right is not always a matter of getting a direct word, which you then obey in the way that Saul heard from Samuel. One interesting thing to note in all of these stories, judges, Samuel, even into kings, one word that we almost never see is Moses. We almost never hear about the law of Moses. It's not as if there's a body of written down rules that King David is obeying and that Saul is not. What makes David a man after God's own heart is he is receptive to the word of God, which he hears through the prophet, and that he seeks to honor God in a way that's not scripted for him, but creative and flowing from his own devotion. Now, where do I get off saying that this is history's first history? I'm not a scholar about all kinds of history all over the world. But what's so engaging to me about this is precisely this idea that there is meaning in events. It's not just a matter of this happened and then this happened and then this happened. When David's house collapses after this sin, it has something to do with the bad choices that he made. Just as when David prospers, it has something to do with his desire to glorify and honor God. And for a text written 3,000 years ago for a pre-Iron Age society, that's an amazing insight that a transcendent purpose comes through our everyday interactions with one another. So good time for any questions or comments you might have. Why did Saul fail? And you point out his incipient madness, right? You point out his, it sounds like migraines sometimes, right? Or uh, worse, worse. It says an evil spirit from the Lord. 
Now that's, yeah, that's a heavy one. <laughs> There's a lot there. If it was an evil spirit from God, you know, that's a hard one to deal with. We'll talk a lot more about that. You know, the figure of Saul as a tragic figure, um, you know, that's, a, that's an interpretive difficulty for us. You know, does it seem like Saul was kind of set up for failure? Um, I mean, couldn't God have picked somebody who would actually succeed? Those are good questions. And you feel bad for Saul. I think it's hard not to feel bad for Saul in some ways. Very unusual story. It's very unusual story in the Bible. Yeah. A tragedy in the Bible. And by that, again, more on this later, but by tragedy, I mean the hero ends badly. Flawed, Flawed hero. Yeah. But then David has a parallel. David is also very deeply flawed. Is that a tragedy? We got to talk about that one. Yeah. Different time, yeah. <laughs> yes, please. And it it, it uh, brings the uh, redemption of Christ by seeing these characters that people idolize as good, but then they fall. And, and yet, someone like David later on, um, he was sorry for what he did, right? David repented, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Yes, linked to repentance. This is correct. Uh, but I also want to say, I mean, in the context of what we're talking about here, too, in terms of history, you know, what's the connection with Christ? You know, um, you have heard that it was said, right? Uh, you shall not kill. But I tell you, whoever is angry has committed murder, right? Or you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, whoever looks lustfully at somebody has committed adultery. It's more than just do this, do this, do this, do this, right? Every moment of our lives is somewhat of a chance for redemption, the little right? Things matter. The little it's things matter. All the little things matter yeah. in Christ. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.